is that our goal is not to be welcoming. Our goal is to be like Christ. Now, being welcoming is a part of that, but as soon as you make welcoming the goal rather than the Christ-likeness, you're done for. Hello, and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. Well, we couldn't fail to notice a headline on NPR that... We got clickbaited. I'm pretty we sure. We got clickbaited. I'm wondering whether some of you listeners caught this one too and wondered whether we would talk about it because it seems almost as though this was just designed to get a rise out of us. In fact, so much so that I didn't read it until yeah. Cameron's like, we have to talk about this. And I was like, okay, fine. Ever the contrary and Nathan there. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll drop the article into the show notes. It's worth it's worth a look. And it's, it's quite brief, but there are some really lovely photographs in it to capture the atmosphere of what's being described but the, 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 the article is called, As Attendance Dips, Churches Change to Stay Relevant for a New Wave of Worshippers. Brought to you by NPR. Brought to you by NPR. And essentially, this, this looks at, I mean, it gives you some, some data that you're well aware of, I'm sure, at this point, that church attendance has been declining in the United States precipitously since the year 2000, especially. But there was a very dramatic drop off in 2020 and the consensus more or less now is that a lot of people left because of the pandemic but that really the pandemic provided the perfect excuse for many people to mm -hmm. say yeah not going back don't need to anymore i'm going to drop the charade at this point and so a lot of churches have been struggling to figure out strategies to deal with this new state of affairs especially some of the more theologically conservative, maybe evangelical churches, mainline churches have continued to hemorrhage mem members for years and years. I mean, that's the whole mainline church discussion is really, Nathan, as I've put it, I've put it, I mean, that's probably a separate discussion, but as I've put it to you before, you look at some of these mainline churches and you just think, well, what, what are you holding on to? I mean, why not just be an atheist at this point? That's my question there. But these other churches are trying to, pivot and figure out new ways to draw in younger people. So one of the churches in the, in the article, it's essentially, it's not a, it doesn't have a building anymore. It's less structured. It's a garden. It's a, it's really, mm -hmm. it's a community garden. This pastor was formerly, I think the, pa the pastor of a large Baptist church. And now he has this, they meet around a fire pit, even when it's cold and there's maybe a 15 minute lesson or something along those lines. And then they all tend to the garden together and work on the compost and they give a lot of produce to the community. I mean, there are some laudable features of what they're doing here. It's going to be harder and harder to maintain a straight face as I, as I described. Yeah, these, I wish this one was, was video. If you could see Cameron's expressions, he, he, he's in pain. Well, and same, same pain. with Nathan watching me. <laughs> Try, <laughs> trying to give a fair representation of well, and then at there's, all what could possibly be good about this. Yeah, and then there's, I mean, there's another one that's, a, it's not, this one's not that unusual. You know, it was once a thriving Methodist church, very beautiful building, is now a coffee house. Mm -hmm. But then there's, then there's the couple who, well, I suppose they're not a couple. There's the, do we call, look, I'll, I'll just deliver this with a straight face as best I can. And then we can, we can comment. There's the pastor and then the, the assistant pastor and they lead yoga exercises in the worship space breathing under stained and I glass think it's, it's called breathing under stained glass and really when you look at some of the the word you know the verbiage that's being used it sounds very much like these are just essentially new age practices very you know new age language being used about breathing in divinity and then divinity breathing you in mm -hmm. that's that's a quote by the way that's i'm not making that up <laughs> and so here the, the people are gathering in their in their yoga attire to you know lie down beneath the, the stained glass and in the episcopal church you know right did i have so, to tell you that was an episcopal church i mean come on that's the, right i mean come on it's a little too kind of, on on the nose of the stereotype there but seriously okay but, was, why yeah. why why does why do we think this is so funny cameron i mean it's not well, it's like one, you either laugh or cry but what's the yeah, go ahead. So, 
Okay, well, so there is a haunting quote, I think, and I, I bet it caught your eye too, Nathan. It's the it's it's how the article closes, and the, so mm-hmm. they give the last word to this this pastor of the community garden, and he says it used to be that we would say, you know, the church needs to change the culture. Now we're talking about changing the culture of the church, and I thought that that was a pretty interesting way to to look at what 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 these these examples are actually trying to work through. You know, because if if the church is going to change the culture, the assumption is that those within the within the walls of the church have it together and are able to set a holistic example. But what's become clear in this story, as this story is relaying it, is that the church, as it you know, the traditional church, let's just call it that, doesn't have it together and isn't. This comes through a lot, actually. Isn't meeting people where they're at, isn't meeting you know, their needs, isn't relevant to their lives anymore, and therefore the church needs to adapt and move with the times. Part of what makes this funny, I think, to us, Nathan, I'll just get us started and then kick it over to you, is that this is more of the same. That's why I think we're chuckling, and it's part of the problem. Because if <laughs> the issue is that the church in the United States, especially in recent years, has worked overtime to try to accommodate mm-hmm. the cultural mood. And yeah. in so doing, has become indistinguishable from the culture itself <laughs> and failed to be an alternative in any meaningful sense. And so eventually, you know, if you have a certain, if Christianity holds a certain level of influence, you can actually get away with that because people have the mental furniture to move with that. But once the influence wanes, then, you know, very obviously, you can go to better coffee shops outside the church. People, I mean, media is done better outside the church. I mean, all of those elements of of culture that, you know, where bridges are being built are done better, <laughs> generally speaking. Yeah, sure. Outside the church. So why stick around? And so mm-hmm. it looks it looks kind of sad because it's it's more of the same and it certainly isn't gonna work. Yeah, well, I mean, the other thing is you're picking examples here, and I know it's a news story, but you're also looking at these new changing the culture of the church that have churches that have like five to 30 people in them. So it's not exactly like you're killing it out there on, uh, oh, now everybody's interested. Um, There's that. I mean, it kind of goes back to, you know, my grandpa would always used to say, very rarely can you put out a fire by putting more wood on it. And so there's Mm -hmm. this idea of like, well, you know, we got to kind of change to keep up with culture. And that's not working, so we got to change more to keep up with culture. Yeah, like you're you're kind of adding more wood to the fire that's already burning there, um, rather than doing something new. So I guess that was why I just kind of gave it a little bit of an eye roll. Well, and something else that struck me, and I hear this, I hear this actually quite a bit. It's not just I don't need the article to confirm this for me, but one of the one of the people who's interviewed in the article, I believe it was a 27 year old PhD student, English PhD student from a fundamentalist background says, I never got, I mean, I just wasn't getting much out of, out of church, the hymns, the sermons, I wasn't getting much out of it. They weren't doing anything for me. So that seems to be a notion again, that's predicated on the thought that you should be getting you some, you need some sort of emotional uplift all the time or some form of dramatic stimulation when you go to church. It needs to be enhancing your mood in some way. Now, I think part of that is understandable, but I think you're a lot of us are hardwired like romantics these days. And mm. what, I, what I mean by that is we always we're always waiting to be moved by the muse in our lives. And generally speaking, and I say this as a person who has an artistic temperament, so I'm very feelings driven. I'm a very I'm a mood heavy person. Yes. But that I mean if if you can't live your life on the basis of feelings alone if you want to get anything done, you're going to have to actually establish real habits and routines. And church does provide some does it sometimes provide dramatic uplift? Can it be a grand and amazing experience? It can. But generally speaking, you it's also going to be repetitive. And that's not a bad thing. This is how habit is formed through repetition. And this is true of any pursuit, whether you're trying to learn calligraphy or a martial art, or if you want to get in shape, 
you have to do the same thing over and over again. And most days, it's not going to be very thrilling. In fact, all, all of the rewards come from a long-term commitment. And church works the same way because it's about, I mean, it, it, it is about worship, but it's also, it's about retooling your heart and re, refining your appetites and reforming you as a person. The reason we don't think that, generally speaking, is because we look at church in consumeristic terms, which is the other irony hovering over this article is how incredibly <laughs> consumeristic the whole thing sounds. Let's tailor make this so it's more appealing to people so that they can, you know, it, give them what they want, give them a product that they want. Maybe that's not totally fair, but there's well, which a, is, certainly yeah, a flavor of that there. Let, let's spread this out a little bit, though, because there's a sense in which you can kind of roll your eyes like, OK, we're going to do breathing exercises under stained glass or pick turnips instead of sing hymns. But there are some other ones that, I mean, I've read them, the advanced strategic church planning manuals that give you the whole economic breakdown and moral psychology framework of how to properly balance the number of pews and number of parking spaces and why you should get rid of your pews and have chairs to have them more individualized and contextualized. Like churches for a long time have been trying. So this is, this is a new it's not even new. It's a, it's a form of strategy, but there've been a lot of other strategies out there that are cultural artifacts that have gotten a pass at the attempt of conducting church. So running your church like a business with a CEO model, using uh, Harvard Law School's reviews of new economic policies in order to grow your organization. I mean, the whole, like that whole branch of things is every bit as much of an acquiescence to culture as some of these other things, but they kind of get a blind pass as far as uh, what's seen as really um, useful and practical and uh, faithful stewardship of resources. And so I just want to be an equal opportunity offender there to say that I mm -hmm. think a lot of, quote, strategic church growth or strategic church interaction has heavily depended on a whole lot of commercial cultural assumptions, um, whether they be uh, a new age spiritualism or a good old, like, let's make this into a business. Both of those are alive and well. And so I, I don't want to pick on just one side of the equation there. Yeah. And I think there's, there's a notion that if you, you want, you join a church, the desire is to find something that lines up purely with your wishes. But I don't think that's true though. Generally speaking, I, I think people want to be challenged more than we we recognize. Mm, I mean, yeah. people don't join. Yeah, I mean, people won't join a gym or a martial arts academy in the hopes of an easy, breezy, you know, experience. They want to be. They want to. They want to be challenged, and they want to grow. And growth involves real stretching and real pain. And so, I want to. We want to make careful distinctions here. I'm aware that there are many people have had experiences with churches that have been legalistic and quite ruthless. So that's that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about places where you 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 are able to grow as a person, where real mo moral growth is promoted. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that and now there are many churches that are doing just that. By the way, I mean. Attendance may be dwindling, but I think the big picture here, I still think is true, is that cultural Christianity is what is dying right now. And oh, it's, sure. it's painful. Yeah. It's sobering. There's a lot we're losing, but it's also, it's a, it's a, it's a moment of kind of awakening, I think, where greater honesty is, is happening and we're beginning to really take the measure of our surroundings. So there are, but there are many churches that are focused on that, but I think the real, the real point of, of emphasis in our churches ought to be on obedience to Christ. And oh, I thought you were going to say finances. Man, I was wrong. Oh, man. Well, I can understand why you would think that, Nathan. But Okay, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> the real focus. Well, yeah, be. but I mean, on yeah, so on leaning into obedience to Christ, I mean, Dallas Willard, here he is. You know, we got to quote, we got to quote him at least once. Here he comes. I think. I think we quote Dallas Willard as much as some people quote C.S. Lewis. <laughs> oh, that would be interesting. Oh, we're those guys. We're those guys. But Willard had had pointed out 
if you make obedience to Jesus the focus of your church, you're going to introduce, I, I mentioned this before on the podcast, you, you will, it'll, it'll come as, as a shock to the system and not everybody will be happy about it. And there'll, there'll usually be resistance and you, you lose members. But what ends up happening is you gain, you gain a kind of a real power and strength of conviction. But I do think that as we lean more into our post-Christian moment, Christians are going to have to, we're going to be defined increasingly, not just by what we say, but by what we do. And so sanctity has to be a point of emphasis. And when that happens, I think everything else falls into place. Evangelism, community outreach, all of these kind of buzzwords that fly around in these discussions, cultural engagement, all of that. The rest, I think we, if we as the people of God in our individual congregations put our efforts, all of our efforts and all of our focus into obedience to Christ, everything else will fall into place. That is the strategy. Yeah, you know, Cameron, I was thinking, um, so two weeks ago, I was down freezing in Hawaii, um, teaching at the YWAM base there for a week, and that was great fun. But originally, they had asked me to speak on cultural engagement, and then we changed the topic to human engagement. And I liked that uh -huh. a whole lot more. That was that was yep. a that was a better space for me to fit into. Not that I don't have a lot of thoughts on all sorts of things as it comes to cultural engagement, but there is that I think a fundamental reset back to if you're listening to this and you're involved in the church, you're curious about the future of the church, you're in church leadership. A couple things to remind ourselves here, based off of what we're we're saying. The first line is that I often use is there's a very fine line between being relevant and being ridiculous. You've heard me say that before, a thin line between being relevant and ridiculous. And, oh man, I've been to churches where I'm like, you are trying so hard to keep up with a cultural fad and you're about three years behind. Like usually when a church thinks they're being cool, they're out of phase and out of fashion by about three years. So first of all, if you're trying to be <laughs> if you're like, make sure, no, I, I don't know. Like, you're probably not doing it well. The second one is, is like, why are we trying to compete in certain categories? Like, the church is not called to do everything well. Um, it does not exist as a, a total, uh, I mean, so I hope you have good coffee and good music at your church, but good coffee and good music are not necessary for good church. Um, you, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. really think through what are the things that only my church can provide to the community around me? So what are the unmet needs that there are no other organizations, institutions, or government programs for? And let's do that really well. Um, that is the type of question you need to start asking yourself. Because at the point that you start trying to compete with Spotify for music quality, you're going to lose. And at the point where you start trying to compete with Starbucks, you're going to lose. But none of that shows up anywhere in scripture as a necessity for what it is that the church is actually doing. And so I continually think that these types of articles are sad in some ways, but they're also helpful in others that we can kind of like roll our eyes about it. But it's a great time for personal recalibration and corporate recalibration if you're thinking of this as a in a leadership position or somebody who's interested in this of saying, what is it that we are called to do well? And let's do that. And so let's focus all of our energy on churchy stuff. And if there's some tangentials, Hey, I like picking beats and sitting around campfires too, but that I'm not going to delude myself into thinking that that replaces worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth corporately, or that it's a perfect formation for equipping and training the saints for ministry. So Part of it is is by recalibrating the expectations of what it is that we have to be doing, so suddenly when we get back into those categories, we recognize that we have a whole lot more to offer there than we do by trying to be something that we were never intended to be. Yeah. And I think also just a good sense of anthropology will help you out here. You are a ritualed creature. I'm drawing my thinking here a little bit from Drew Johnson, D-R-U, Drew, cool Drew. Drew Johnson, who teaches at King's College, has written several books. But 
and there's there's a there's an academic version of this, and then there's one called human rights, R I T E S S. But basically, you brush your teeth every day, not because you so enjoy brushing your teeth or the taste of taste of toothpaste, but because you're you're becoming a certain kind of person, and this ritual is good for good dental hygiene. I think we need to look at church a little bit more like brushing our teeth mm. than mm -hmm. looking at it as some sort of amazingly inspiring experience. Now, again, it can be. I think in a given church service, if you're going through, if you have elements of repentance, confession, and worship, you're ultimately getting a grand cosmic vision and liturgy, one that can feel completely and totally boring, but one that once your spiritual senses are awakened and once your appetites are refined can be amazingly exciting and grand and a real adventure. But it's also, it's something that's meant to form you into a certain kind of person. It's meant to, it's meant to, to make you the kind of person who is in touch with the reality of God's reign. That's, that's what it's, and so that's what you do when you go and worship the Lord in spirit and truth, when you hear the gospel, when you sing those songs, recite those creeds, when you see people baptized, and when you take communion. This is forming you into a certain kind of person, just like exercising, just like brushing your teeth. I like to use these, these kinds of mundane scenarios because they help to, I, again, we have this romantic penchant stops us from seeing the basic realities of how we as human beings work. And so, yeah, if you're going for an amazing experience each time, then yeah, going every single Sunday and then, you know, being involved throughout the week, goodness gracious, it'll get old really fast. I mean, a church is not meant to provide that kind of entertainment day in and day out. That's that's asking it to be something it isn't, and it's putting incredible pressure on clergy and spiritual leaders as well. Yeah, but it's but not, I think if not we only, have a, yeah. Well, I think it's not only that it isn't that, I, we're also saying that it shouldn't want to be that. No. And so I think that's the, that's the, the tension there, like the recalibration that needs to happen. Um, yeah. I want to, I want to talk to you about shortcuts to grandeur, but before we get there, I want to interrupt our broadcast here to say a special thanks to all of the people who make the work that we do possible. And many of you are donors and contributors to the show. And as we come to the end of the year here, we start getting like our little like Spotify wrap up of like what all has happened. And it's fun to look at all the different people in all the different countries where you guys are tuning in from. They also tell us that we produce 97% more, or we produce more content than 97% of the other podcast uh, in the religious categories. <laughs> yeah, we do. So that means that if you stick with us, you are listening to way more. Uh, and we're spouting off about way more stuff than most other podcasts. So there's a funny little tidbit for you. Um, but no, seriously, thank you so much to those of you who have um, prayerfully and fiscally supported our work that we're doing. Uh, we've come through a lot in our first year. We're thrilled to still be existing and still be growing. And with your future support and contributions, we uh, look forward to doing even more in the next year. Excited about the release of some uh, new traveling and speaking opportunities, but also some podcast upgrades and then also curriculum development. So we have a lot of irons in the fire and we appreciate those of you who are fueling that, fueling those flames. Um, and as always, as you get toward the end of the year, if you have a couple extra dollars and you're looking for a place to put them, we'd be happy to put them to good use for you. So anyway, special thanks to those of you who make this happen. Uh, kind of in this season of Thanksgiving and gratitude, we want to make sure that we uh, stop and acknowledge those of you who make this all work. So thanks so much. Cameron, back mm. to what we were saying earlier. You're talking about this idea of the mundane, but then there are, it's punctuated with moments of like awe, and it can be very exciting and personally uplifting. My question is, does it seem like we're trying to take shortcuts to get to that sensation? Is that ultimately what we're talking about is to say, rather than go through the hard work of achieving this outcome, we can, there's a, there's a, uh, a modern shortcut to get to that sensation without doing the hard work. Is that essentially what we're doing here? Is that what we're talking about? I think so. I mean, we, we've been a sensate culture for a long time, but that's just, that's become such a point of obsession for so many people. 
look at the prevalence now of, you know, recreational drug usage is once again, you know, just skyrocketing. But also as we, we're seeing more of these, you know, these practices become legalized. I mean, I can't, can't tell you the last, in the last, you know, couple of weeks, how many casual conversations I've had about shrooms and, and marijuana. Well, now, we talked. Yeah. And your, your YouTube advertisements are now for edibles, you know, that's, Edible, oh, edibles. Yeah, ed- I didn't. Yeah. So here's a funny story. Yeah, that th- th- those kept coming up, and I had to finally figure out. I mean, I was reading between the lines and thinking, okay, these these are clearly this is clearly some you know THC laced product, but I had never heard of them <laughs> of edibles before. But sure, sure have now. They keep, they come up over and over again. Well, the but brownies yeah, at mean, your Christmas party next year at church. If you really want to be culturally relevant just making a suggestion but that's where i hear but you know you're joking but that's where i keep hearing it coming up it's it's at office parties (laughs) that's what but yeah so but many many conversations around these you know these different kinds of practices and products let's call them products right have to do with they turn toward very quickly towards spiritual experiences that's what people are talking about Mm -hmm. yeah and so there's a there's a huge hunger for transcendence and some and you know some kind of spiritual experience where you can you know but we have at our disposal just so many tools now to make that happen instantaneously i mean even think about you met you mentioned spotify i've i think i've brought this up before but something as simple as that of course there's nothing simple about spotify actually when you talk about it whether you're talking about the compensation they render to their artists or their wrapped list and the the incredible amount of data that they have on you. But when I was younger, one of my wildest dreams would have been having unfettered access to a catalog of music like that, right? It, it, mm-hmm. It's the equivalent of basically somebody marches you into a record store and says, all right, the the whole thing is yours. All the inventory, it's all yours. I mean, I literally dreamed of this. I've been a music fanatic my whole life. And now we have it. And, you know, there are law, lo- I mean, there are going to be, there are always consequences. This always reshapes our thinking when you have instantaneous access to everything. What do we, what do we always say about information? Information's cheap now, right? And so mm-hmm. we don't take it as seriously. And so wis- we're short on wisdom and we're also intellectually lazy. You know, we rely on Google Maps. Okay, so you have Spotify now. Well, all of that music now has been cheapened in a sense, right? And how do we? How do you? How can you tell that it's been cheapened? What? What are we? Who are we unwilling to pay? We're perfectly willing to buy fancy technology for streaming services, but we're not willing to pay artists. You know, and I'm speaking broadly. Now, of mm-hmm. course, there's a big physical media comeback and all of that. You know, most most people don't pay for the music they listen to anymore. So, yeah, there's that instantaneous nature, and it does have serious consequences. And so are we trying to take shortcuts to glory and transcendence? Yes, absolutely. I think we're, we're doing it left, right, and center. And I think it's in, you know, as with anything, when you when you overdo it and when you go you know, you take too much of something all at once, it it, it actually ends up deadening your senses and wearing you down so that you need more and more and more and more just to get kind of a, a fix. I'm using, you know, kind of addiction language, but it applies. It, I think it does apply pretty broadly here. So there's a bleak answer for you. <laughs> yeah. So as we kind of wrap this up though, I guess you can get a, there are no shortcuts to long-term solutions, but there are shortcuts right. to short-term sensations. Absolutely. Yes. That's a very well, that's well put. And that I think is the, the distinguishing thing that we're trying to figure out here as we think about religious experience that in so many ways, yeah, I guess, I guess we're all sensation seeking creatures. On the other Mm -hmm. hand, as you plumb the depths of what you would want out of a religious experience and community, I'm willing to bet that actually you would prefer to have longevity be part of it. And so the the idea of the inherent stability that comes from a worshiping community, even if it asks difficult things of you in order to continue to exist for the entirety of your life and into the future of your children and your children's children's life, 
is worth it. And so there's a bit of a return on investment thing here that is interesting that even Jesus, you think, you know, Luke 14, this all idea of counting the cost and thinking clearly through, do you really want to be, I mean, Jesus almost goes out of his way to peel off the half-hearted seekers and followers, mm-hmm. which is exactly the opposite of what so much it seems to me that we're trying to do these days. Now, I'm not saying, you know, don't be unkind and don't be welcoming, but I have a little note written that I frequently remind our congregation of is that our goal is not to be welcoming. Our goal is to be like Christ. Now, Mm -hmm. being welcoming is a part of that, but as soon as you make welcoming the goal rather than the Christ likeness, you're done for. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we, we do have to keep like our real value. Like, what are we actually trying to do? I guess that's the question you need to, I've asked multiple times, you need to answer for yourselves. What are we actually trying to do here? And then, Are the expenditures of our time and energy and effort and prayer life and lives putting energy into those right categories, or are we just blowing smoke in the wrong, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and frustrating ourselves in the process? So, Cameron, I guess, could we do this as we end to say, okay, so you're listening to this. What then does Cameron want out of a, quote, church experience? What are you, what are you seeking? I'll answer for myself on the other side of this as well. but. You know, we do exist, our voices do count, and we represent a whole group of you who listen to this who are statistically, according to Spotify, a younger crew mm-hmm. of people who are interested and you're sticking in here, you listen to us, you're listening to a podcast that tells you to listen to less podcasts and go to church more. So clearly you guys also have an interest in trying to figure out how to do this well. So let's take a moment here and just lay some of those things on the table. Like if you're not going to church to breathe under the stained glass or to pick turnips, what are we doing there, Cameron? Yeah. I think for answering for myself, this is, there's no great novelty, anything I'm going to say here, which is part of why I think it's probably the importance of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I'm go, I go to church to worship the Lord in spirit and truth and to pursue transformation into Christ likeness with fellow believers in an iron sharpening iron environment. That's really the essence of church for me. How about you, Nathan? Yeah, no, I I think it starts off there. Um, And I think we even use that line, worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth at the beginning. It was Moses's prayer that the Lord's glory would be made known among the people. Um, And so I think having moments where we do that corporately together in a building is fine. I think also looking at the ways in which those relationships then are formative throughout the entire week in which we function Mm -hmm. as a community outside of the walls of the structure are very important to me as well. Um, Church experience is a little bit more like being in a gang than being in an organization Um, in a sense of mutual responsibility, protection, looking out for one another, providing for one another and (laughs) having um, a system and a structure that organ, uh, works outside of uh the normal avenues sometimes don't want to glamorize gang life there at all but just to say that um i think the familial language is a very important part of that we talk about Mm -hmm. blood being thicker than water Uh, it turns out that spirit is thicker than blood and so we do Mm -hmm. form those uh familial real familial structures with inside the worshiping community um and then also like you said my third one is your second one of a place that equips the saints for ministry and so am i being Am I there just to be told neat things by a minister or am I there to be prepared for ministry mm-hmm. in all of my life? And so that's that's a little short list from both of us, but I think that is what, yeah, that's an honest answer of what we are both seeking. We hope those are the types of things that you're seeking as well. And I think for those of us who are involved in congregational leadership and want to help people see the glory of the Lord and live that out in a way that he is honored and that it's good for their neighbors and good for us as well, um, that we need to be thinking along the lines of how do we do that? It's not a question of how do we get more people through the doors? That part's a little easier, but it's about how do we grow in the direction of Christ likeness in a way that um, really is something to celebrate. I think we'll leave it there. Those are are big questions. They're heavy ones. Maybe take a minute and pencil down some thoughts. Uh, and then go live them out for the next 50 years. The Lord can work with that. You've been listening to Thinking Out Loud, the podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, 
or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.